Well, even 400,000 years is a pretty small period of time. And John just really gets comfortable when he's dealing with these millions of years. And Chris showed us a slide that goes, went back hundreds of millions. I'll be more conservative and just come back six million years. Here's our temperature curve again, this time not from ice cores, but from deep sea cores. This is the research I personally work on. And you see these great glacial, interglacial fluctuations that we looked at four of in the last 400,000 years. That little box is the slide we've just looked at. And what you see is that even the warmer interglacial periods are several degrees cooler here it is, 10 degrees, roughly, than the planet was in this period of time from three and a half million years ago and older. Yet every week I read some idiot biologist in the newspaper telling me the biodiversity of the planet is going to be destroyed by another temperature rise of a degree or two. It is complete nonsense, and it mostly comes, again, from computer models. The planet biota we have today grew up with and is adapted, firstly, in its genetic inheritance, firstly, to temperatures that are on average warmer than today, secondly, by God, you'd better believe they're adapted to climate change because look what they've just been through. They can cope with rapid climate change. And thirdly, they're adapted to a world which, on the whole, was about three degrees warmer than it is today. So that's magnitude of climate change. Is there anything unusual about the magnitude of modern climate change? Late 20th century? No, none whatsoever. Ah, Bob, you're forgetting the rate. It's not the magnitude, it's not the height of the peak, it's the scaling up the side. The rate is unusual, is it? Same data from the ice cores. I promise you this is the most difficult graph except perhaps one I'm going to show you today. Please concentrate, it's important. What's plotted is the rate of change of temperature in degrees per hundred years, degrees per century. If we go back into the ice age here, we see that the rate of temperature change was as high as almost 15 degrees, that's 1.5 degrees per decade. Sometimes it cooled, warmed, sometimes it cooled. Well, of course, we don't live in this sort of a time, and we don't want to again, though ultimately we'll have to. We live in this sort of a time, and you can see that the rate of change is less. But it's still significant. Here are the two constraining lines. In, in that box in the last 5,000 years, there are the two lines that constrain the variation. And the rate is, on average, between plus and minus 2.5 degrees per century. So the obvious question is, using the best available satellite data, what is the rate today? Here's the satellite graph from 1979 through to 2005. And yes, if we wish, we can fit a line. And lo and behold, the line says on average it's warming at about one and a half degrees per century. Is that unusual? No. It's right within the geological envelope of change, and it just happens to be warming, it could just as easily have been cooling. Furthermore, what about this peak up here? That's the 1998 El Nino peak. I'm nothing to do with greenhouse gas, yet that peak is to a very large degree, together with these two peaks, pulling the right hand end of the line up. These two troughs, which are due to volcanic eruptions, are pulling the left-hand end of the line down. And as Chris has already said, a much more reasonable interpretation of this set of data is, in fact, that there's no change over that period of time except perhaps for a slight step shift across the 1998 El Nino. So, climate is not changing, either in rate or in magnitude, in any way unusual in the late 20th century. And notice the late 20th century phase of warming. There's no warming in the 21st century. We've had stasis for the last eight years. At the same time, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased by 4%. The hypothesis is increases in carbon dioxide will cause dangerous global warming. The hypothesis is tested by that data set, and it fails the test. Yet still it pops up back in the paper every other day. OK. Well, it just happens that in the last few weeks, the IPCC and the traditional global warming alarmist uh, um, campaign has taken a number of severe torpedo hits. Any one of them is enough to go right back to the drawing board. And I started with a picture on my title slide of a Salvador Dali painting. I forgot to say that being a professional scientist at the moment is like living right inside a Salvador Dali painting. You are surrounded by these exquisitely detailed scientific interpretations done by scientists who are fellows of the Royal Academy 
leading scientists in the world, and they're nearly all imaginary. The real data tells you there is no problem at the moment. That's not to say there might be a problem, we shouldn't think about it, but there is no empirical data for the greenhouse hypothesis being true, the dangerous one. And if you test it against the sort of data I've just given you, it fails, that test and many others. So I'm going to share with you now a few of these torpedoes. Here's the first one, and I'm proud to say it comes from our own Houses of Parliament. We have a, a Member of Parliament for Western Australia called Dennis Jensen, and he was a minority member of a committee set up by the House to look at carbon sequestration. The committee was chaired by uh, Petro Giorgio, who, although a member of the Liberal Party, is nonetheless a global warming um, zealot or devotee. And so the report, which was on sequestration, wasn't to do with global warming at all. Uh, Giorgio insisted on having statements in it saying climate change was a big real problem. In which case, the scientist on the committee, that Dennis Jensen, <laughs> said, OK, then we're going to write a minority report. And this was his minority report, tabled a couple of weeks ago. We do not believe the evidence unequivocally supports the hypothesis of anthropogenic global warming. We view it as very disappointing that a committee on science innovation has put out, that misunderstands the nature of the scientific method. And yet much blunter than that. <laughs> climate change is a natural phenomenon, it's always been, but it's always will be. Whether human activities are disturbing climate in dangerous ways has yet to be proven. Now those are absolutely accurate, scientifically sober statements. They're made by, it happens to be, the only qualified scientist in our entire parliamentary system. This was the most important thing in the whole report. Most of the public statements that promote the dangerous human warming scare are made from a position of ignorance by political leaders, press commentators and celebrities who share the characteristics of a lack of scientific training, lack of an ability to differentiate between sound science and computer-based scaremongering. Well, this is a very important minority report. It follows a report of the House of Lords in England and several reports from the US Senate which have drawn the same conclusion. Three sovereign houses of parliament in three sophisticated scientific nations, Western nations, have concluded that the alarmist case does not stack up. You'd think this would be greeted with clapping your hands and well done, Dennis. You'd be joking. This, I might say, is the first torpedo. So here's what, sorry, people had to say. Jensen's wrong because 43 out of the 46 submissions said so. <laughs> Jensen's report is philosophical waffle. What planet are these government MPs on? Dr. Jensen is a dinosaur. Jensen Group is the flat earth four. <laughs> Dan Avail is simply daffy. Well, we might, um, I won't say. Won't <laughs> You're laughing. This is our sovereign power. We have one person in that parliament with the training and the ability to write an accurate report on climate change. He does so. This is the result. It's an absolute disgrace. Rule one, never discuss the science. Attack the man, repeat the mantra. Dangerous global warming is happening. I'm not surprised Tim Flannery isn't here today. 